Chapter 17 When Ben gets home, he grabs a snack and is about to head back outside when his mom calls out, There's something for you in your room. He runs down the hall and finds a big box sitting on his bedroom floor. Its corners are squashed and Ben recognizes his own handwriting on the side. Ben's room. Finally, he says to himself. He drops his backpack, rips the tape off the box, and pulls back the flaps. His mom comes in and leans against the door, watching him. His first thought when he looks through the box is that there's not as much stuff as he remembered. What's missing? He pulls up the little pill bottles holding insects, the plastic food containers that hold snake skin, the posters of dead animal, desert animals he folded so carefully when he packed in Tucson, and finally, down at the bottom, his books and his collection of rocks. Happy? His mother asks. Yeah, Ben says. His mother smiles and leaves the room. Ben looks through his stuff again. It's all there, but it still feels like something is missing. It's not as exciting or as comforting as he thought it would be. All of the things in the box seem like parts of his life from some lo from long so long ago, some other time, some other place. He's glad he got the box back, but it doesn't seem so important now. He puts the stuff back in the box and runs to the kitchen. His mom is busy with something on the other side of the room, so Ben grabs a handful of cookies and heads outside. He thinks about going by the trail, but decides his bike will be faster. He wants to get to Mrs. Tibbetts' house before anyone else does, but by the time he gets there, the driveway is filled with cars. Mrs. Tibbetts' old station wagon sits next to her sister-in-law's car. Parked behind them are, are a bright green van with the name of a real estate company on the side and a blue car with a state insignia on the door. An insignia is a word here which means like a symbol, so there's a state symbol on their door. Ben's heart races. He knocks on the front door. When nobody answers, he walks around to the back and finds four people standing in a semicircle, a word here which means half circle, looking at the back field. Sandwiched between Mrs. Tibbetts and her sister-in-law are a tall lady in a business suit with a purse slung over her shoulder and a short, stocky man in a brown windbreaker, an ancient green baseball cap, and hiking boots. Think about that word sandwiched. At first thought, when I think of a sandwich, I think of a sandwich that you eat, right? But when you think about a sandwich, it's two pieces of bread with some things in the middle. So this is saying Mrs. Tibbetts, two other people, and her sister-in-law are standing in a row. He's holding a clipboard under one arm. No one's talking. They're just standing there like they'd rather be somewhere else. They all turn when they hear Ben come up. Hello, Ben says Mrs. Tibbetts. Hi, Ben says back. This is Tabitha Turner, my sister-in-law, and this is Adelia Garrett, her real estate agent. And this, you must be the young man who called, says the man in the green cap. His face breaks into a grin. I'm Hank Lindsay, he says, holding out his hand. Ben's dad has always told him you can tell a lot from someone's handshake, and Ben likes the friendly way Miss, uh, Hank Lindsay shakes his hand. Hi, Mr. Lindsay. The real estate agent looks at Ben and Mr. Lindsay like she thinks they don't they don't belong there, but Ben isn't leaving, not now. Then Mrs. Tibbetts' sister-in-law speaks up. Excuse me, but I'm still mystified as to why this boy felt free to invite a person from the state onto my property. Mystified. If I think about mystified, I think about a mystery. She's still mystified, which means she's still confused as to why this boy felt to, uh, why uh, Ben invited somebody onto the property. I spoke with Mr. Lindsay too, Tabitha, Mrs. Tibbetts says. I told him he should come. Tabitha Turner sniffs and shakes her head. Well, says Mrs. Garrett, this certainly is a beautiful piece of property. It has terrific possibilities. She gives Hank Lindsay a tight little smile. There's an awkward moment of silence, and Ben is glad he doesn't have to do anything but stand there and be a kid. Well, Mr. Lindsay says, taking out his clipboard, let's go have a look. It's over here, says Mrs. Tibbetts. The pool is down the path on the other side of the garage. She leads the way, and everyone follows behind her in a straggly line. What was in there? Mr. Lindsay asks, nodding to the empty cage beside the garage. Snakes, says Mrs. Tibbetts, hurrying towards the trailhead. My husband was a herpetologist. A herpetologist is someone who studies snakes. I see ologist. Ologist means someone who studies. So a biologist would be someone who studies things that are living. A herpetologist goes with snakes.
Tabitha shakes her head and mumbles something to Mrs. Garrett. Um, oh, sorry, I know, Mr. Lindsay says. I met him several times. He knew his stuff. Tabitha shakes her head and mumbles something to Mrs. Garrett as they try to keep up with the others. Swallows swoop overhead and a mockingbird calls out from the branches of the tree in a back field. This is an interesting piece of land, Mr. Lindsay says. There are several different habitats. There's that meadow behind the house and it looks like there's an outcropping of granite over there. And a vernal pool, Ben says hopefully. The real estate agent swats at the gnats flying around her head. As they enter the woods, the canopy of the leaves above them casts splotchy shadows on the forest floors. It's a little wet back here, Mr. Lindsay says. I don't know if you could build on this part. It's always wetter in the spring, the real estate agent says, treading carefully to avoid getting mud on her shiny shoes. It takes a while for this odd mix of hikers to get through the woods. Mr. Lindsay, Ben, and Mrs. Tibbetts stop several times on the path so the two other women can catch up. Well, when they near the vernal pool, Ben runs ahead. It's almost like he wants to warn the pool that people are coming. But when he gets to the big rock, he stops and stares. There's no pool there. He can't believe it. It's completely dried up. If he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, he would have never be he would never be believe there was a pool here only a few days ago. Now it's just a little dip in the ground, surrounded by rocks and trees, their leaves casting a deep shadow where the pool had been. Small yellow-green bunches of leaves are shooting up out of the spot. Ben hears the others approaching and turns to face them. This is the pool, he says, hoping Mr. Lindsay can see something that isn't there. This is where the spadefoots come. But there's nothing here, exclaims Mrs. Mrs. Garrett. Not even a puddle. But it was here, Ben says. It's been here every year for thousands of years. Oh, really? says the real estate agent. Mr. Lindsay squats and looks at the site. They all watch him. He scratches the back of his head and then pushes aside the plants growing out of the dark, rotting leaves. He presses a finger into the damp earth. He's like a doctor examining a patient. What do you think? Ben asks. Mr. Lindsay stands up and looks around with his hands on his hip. He steps back several yards and then walks in a circle, checking the ground several times. He scribbles something in a notebook attached to his clipboard. Well... It could be a significant sight, he said. It's a vernal pool for sure. But there's nothing here, Mrs. Garrett insists. Surely you can't say this is a significant sight when there's no sign of a pond here. Yes, ma'am. There are signs. I can tell it's a vernal pool. Ben smiles and glances over at Mrs. Tibbetts. Her eyes are on the place where the pool once was. But everyone turns to look at Mr. Lindsay. There are two problems. First, we'd have to document that it contains the threatened or endangered species that need vernal pools to survive. We saw the spadefoots, Ben practically shouts. Mrs. Tibbetts has seen them for years. Right, says Mr. Lindsay, but we'd need proof. Pictures or something. It wouldn't have to be spadefoot toads. There are other vernal pool species. Fairy shrimp, fingernail clams, and catifus larvae, for example. But everything has to be well documented before we can stop any development. Just what I've been saying all along, says Mrs. Garrett. You can't hold us up from selling something without proof. I've got a buyer and an owner who is ready to sell. End of story. But Mr. Lindsay, Ben begs, can't you just hold off on the builders until we can get proof? Ick, excuse me, young man, Mrs. Turner says, really stewing now. When someone is stewing, they're very angry. Will you please stay out of this? You have no say here. Leave him be, Tabitha. Mrs. Tibbet snaps. Everybody shuts up and stares at her. Ben, let Mrs. Tibbet and Mr. Mr. Lindsay talk. Mr. Lindsay takes off his cap, smooths back his thinning hair, and then replaces the cap on his head. There are other problems. In order to be certified as a vernal pool, the site would have to be filled with water for at least two months, and I'm not sure this pool would be big enough to qualify. But that's not fair, Ben blurts out. The spadefoots don't care how big it is. They need it to live. Gloria! Mrs. Turner says to her sister-in-law, glaring at Ben like he's a dog that needs discipline. Can't you do something about this boy? He's right, Mr. Lindsay says. It's not fair, but it's the way the laws are written. There are spadefoot toads here, Mrs. Tibbet says, and they are endangered, Ben adds. I know, I know. Mr. Lindsay tucks his clipboard back under his arm. It's a weird little loophole in the law. Spadefoot toads are particularly difficult to document since they don't need a very big pool. So, the real estate agent says, it's not really a problem. 
Mr. Lindsay looks at her and sighs. Unless you're a spadefoot. Ben feels tears welling up in his eyes. He can't believe there's nothing anyone can do. Without another word, the adults turn and head back toward the house. Ben falls in beside Mrs. Tibbetts, and she places her hand on his shoulder. It's a long, quiet walk. When they reach Mrs. Tibbetts' yard, they all stand in the driveway. Mrs. Garrett breaks the silence. So, Mr. Lindsay, things have not really changed in terms of what can happen to the land. There's nothing to prevent its sale. No, Mr. Lindsay hesitates, but you know... If there was a real concern about preserving an endangered habitat, it's possible that the sale could be made to a group that would protect it. The Nature Conservancy or the land trust in the town might buy the land. They would pay you and then not develop it. But not at its full value, the real estate agent Aiden says. Development is really the way to get the most out of this piece of property. Selling it to some nature group wouldn't be nearly as profitable. Not as profitable as putting up a bunch of houses, no. He looks over at Mrs. Turner. But I'm sure they would offer a fair price. It's a special piece of land, even if the state can't protect it. Mrs. Tibbetts keeps her eyes on her sister-in-law. Mrs. Turner stares down at the driveway pavement with a straight mouth, arms folded across her chest. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay, she says. We appreciate your time. Mrs. Tibbetts blows a short, exasperated burst of air out of her mouth. Her sister-in-law frowns. Selling the land helps you too, Gloria. Don't make me the bad guy. It's silent again. Mr. Lindsay takes the wallet out of his pocket and pulls out a card. He hands it to Mrs. Turner. She looks at the card like it's poison, but she takes it. If you have any questions or concerns, he says, give me a call. He shakes hands all around and comes to Ben at la Ben last. It's a pleasure to meet you, young man. Ben smiles weakly and shakes his hand, but he's hugely disappointed in this man who should have been able to make things right. As Mr. Lindsay drives away, Mrs. Turner and the real estate woman stand by the van talking quietly. I'm going out ins inside, Tabitha, Mrs. Tibbetts calls. We'll talk later, her sister-in-law answers. Ben and Mrs. Tibbetts watch as the car and the real estate van pull out of the driveway. Want a cookie? Mrs. Tibbetts asks, putting a hand on Ben's shoulder. Okay, Ben says. Ben sits at the kitchen table where he sat a half dozen times before. The late afternoon sun shines through a window onto Mrs. Tibbetts' hand, resting on the table just across from him. It's over, Ben thinks. All of this and nothing happens. The houses get built. The spadefoots lose their home. Isn't there anything you can say to your sister-in-law? He asks. Mrs. Tibbetts shakes her head. There's not a thing I can do. We're just too far apart, and she wouldn't listen to me no matter what I said. But Mr. Lindsay said she could still make money, even if she sold the land to people who would take care of it. I know, but she's got her mind made up. They have a buyer who's willing to pay a lot of money. I can't imagine what would change her, what would make her change her mind. Ben looks out the window and tries to picture the trees gone and the land filled up with houses. Her husband wouldn't have sold the land so someone could build houses on it, would he? No, he loved this land. Doesn't she love it too? You'd think so. She grew up on it. I tried reminding her of that, but she wouldn't listen. She won't listen to anything I say. Some of Mrs. Tibbetts' words catch Ben's attention. She grew up on it. An idea hits him. Mrs. Tibbetts, where are those pictures? What pictures? You know, those old pictures you were going through a couple of weeks ago? Where are they? On the dining room table. Ben jumps up and runs to the dining room. He brings the box back into the kitchen and dumps the contents onto the table. Mrs. Tibbetts washes him without speaking as he searches through the yellowed old photographs. He finds the snapshot he's looking for and holds it up in the fading daylight. It's the picture of the two kids sitting on the rock. Suddenly, he realizes that, that it's the rock he and Mrs. Tibbetts sat on by the vernal pool. He gazes at the picture, watching the years fall away. What does Ben mean by watching the years fall away? In this case, he means he's seeing a picture from the past, so he's really trying to focus in on who Tabitha is. The girl is Tabitha and the boy is Thomas. They are holding American toads. The girl has a big grin and doesn't look anything like grown-up Mrs. Tabitha Turner. Ben flips over the photo. Scrawled on the back are these words, Tom, me, and the overtoad. He turns over the picture again and looks at the girl holding the toad. The overtoad. Tabitha and the overtoad. Mrs. Tibbetts, this is Tabitha. 
isn't it? Mrs. Tibbets takes the photo and holds it at arm's length. Yes, she says, squinting. It's Tabitha and Thomas. Look at what she wrote on the back. She knows about the overtoad. You mean she knew about it when she was little. But she forgot, Ben says. Yes, she forgot. Things happen when you grow up and you forget. Mrs. Tibbets gets to up to put the dishes in the sink and Ben slips the photo into his jacket pocket. I have to go now, he says. I need to get to work on my geography report. Mrs. Tibbets dries her hand on a dish towel. Your report? I thought you said it was due today. It was, but Mrs. Kutcher gave me another week. I changed what I'm doing it on. If I don't finish it this time, she'll kill me. No, oh, I doubt that. Well, bye, Ben says and scoots out the back door. There's so much to do and he doesn't know if he has enough time. But he whirls around and sticks his head back through the doorway. Mrs. Tibbets, maybe the overtoad will save us. I'd love that, Mrs. Tibbets says. Stop and make some predictions about what you think is going to happen next. Two days later, on a hot Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Ben leads Ryan and Jenny down the path from his house. They're all carrying supplies for an expedition, and Jenny's got her camera slung around her neck. Ryan drops the plastic containers he's carrying, and they skitter across the trail. Ben and Jenny help him pick them up. It's good your body parts are attached, Jenny says, or you'd lose them too. Ryan laughs, like you never lose anything, you're so perfect. Jenny smiles. Ben slows down to check his pocket. Did he forget the list of things to search for at the side of the vernal pool? No, it's there, along with the pictures he printed from the internet. Eggs from fairy shrimp, caddy fish cases, snail shells, fingernail clams. Nothing they're looking for is longer than two inches, but Ben hopes he can find some specimens to show what lives in a vernal pool. He wants to show everything he can in his report. When they get to the side of the pool, Ben stops. Here it is, he says. Ryan and Jenny stare at the mud-encrusted, leaf-strewn ground. I don't see any pool, says Ryan. I told you. That's what a vernal pool does, says Ben. It dries up. But there's nothing left to find, Ryan says. There's got to be something. Help me look. And Jenny, will you take some pictures of the area? Ben steps carefully out to the middle of the darkened leaves where the pool was and squats down. Ryan starts shoving leaves and dirt aside. I don't see anything, he says. Hey, Ben yells, you've got to be more careful. We don't want to mess everything up. While Jenny snaps pictures, Ryan and Ben work quietly and methodically, shifting, sifting through the mud. First, Ben finds a catfish casing. Then Ryan shouts, hey, look, a little clamshell, and here's another one. I know, Ben says. It's like there's nothing there, but when you look closely and bam, a whole different world opens up. Within 15 minutes, they fill a couple of containers with snails, clams, and catfish shells. Too bad we can't get a spade foot, says Ryan. They're around here somewhere, says Ben, but they're impossible to find. Just then, something moves in the leaves by his feet. He bends over and pushes the leaves aside. Ben gently places his hand over the creature and picks it up. Is it a spade foot? Ryan asks. Nope, says Ben. Nope, says Ben. It's a wood frog. Remember the one I brought into school? They use fernal pools, too. He opens his hand carefully. Look at it! The three of them peer down at its tan, smooth skin and the dark mask around its eyes. It's cool, Ryan says. Ben looks at the frog. Then he looks at Jenny and Ryan. An idea comes into his head. A great idea. You guys, go sit on that rock over there, Ben says, pointing to the boulder by the side of the pool. How come? Ryan asks. Just do it, please. Jenny shakes her head, but she follows Ryan to the rock and clambers up behind him. Um, Jenny, can I use your camera? Ben asks. He takes the camera from her and puts the strap around his neck. One more thing, he says, holding the frog to Jenny. You have to hold this. Hold it up so I can see it. No way! What if it poops on me? Consider yourself blessed. Just take it, I'll hurry. They're laughing as Ben focuses the camera on them. Okay, he says. Jenny, hold the frog a little higher. Both of you guys smile. Ribbit. Ryan says, ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. Ben clicks the picture. Ben works like crazy on his report. For the next five days, it's all he thinks about. The best part about the, a report is what it, what it feels like when it's finished. It's like Ben hasn't taken a deep breath for weeks, and suddenly his lungs are filled with fresh air. Or like he's taken off a pair of really dark sunglasses and can finally see clearly again. 
and when he's finished he knows it's good. He just hopes it's good enough. It's raining, but by the time Ben finds the street he's looking for, it has started to pour. He's drenched, but his report is inside his jacket, safely tucked into a plastic bag. He pedals his bike slowly so he can see the street numbers, and then recognizes the car in one of the driveways. Ben parks his bike on the sidewalk and walks to the door and knocks. Nobody answers, so he knocks again. He's about to give up when the door answers. Tabitha Turner stands there looking surprised. Yes? Hello, Mrs. Turney. I'm Ben Maroney. Drops of rain trickle from his hair and slide down his nose. He wipes his face with the sleeve of his jacket. I met you at Mrs. Tibbetts' house. I know who you are. I'm really sorry to bother you, but I've got something I want to show you. It's my report for geography. She raises one eyebrow. Geography? Yes, ma'am, geography. It'll all just take a minute, please. Tabitha Turner looks back in the house like she's trying to figure out a way to escape, but she, she steps to the side and motions for Ben to come in. You can hang your wet jacket on that coat rack, she tells him, and maybe you'd better leave your shoes by the door. Ben does as he's told and follows Mrs. Turner into a large living room. She sits in a straight back chair by the window. Ben checks the seat of his jeans to make sure it isn't wet and then perches on the edge of the couch. With his heart pounding, he slides his report out of the plastic bag and places it on the coffee table. I wanted to show you my report on ecosystems, he says, scooting it over so she can see it. She glances down at the report and then looks at him blank blankly, like she's still trying to figure out what he's talking about. Um, I was going to do it on the desert, because that's where I lived until four months ago. I really loved it there. There was this great museum near my house, and I had all this stuff about deserts. I even had a lizard. Its name was Lenny, but I didn't get to bring it with me when I moved. My friend Co Toby was keeping it, and it died. Mrs. Turner nods, waiting to hear what this is all about. But when I started my desert report, I didn't feel like doing it anymore. Ben is halfway afraid to go on, but there's nothing to do but just plow ahead. So instead, I decided to do it about what it's, it's like where I live now. He takes a deep breath and lets it all out. I decided to do it about your land, about your vernal pool. Tabitha Turner clears her throat and shifts uncomfortably in the chair as if she's about to speak, but Ben doesn't give her a chance to interrupt. He opens his report and holds it out to her. I know you don't have time to read all of this, but here I talk about how the pool has been there for a really long time, probably for 10,000 years, and about the people who have lived there. The Wampanoag Indians walked through here maybe a thousand years ago. They were the ones who met the pilgrims. Ben thumbs to and through until he finds the photos. See, here are some of the animals that live in vernal pools. These are salamanders, spotted ones I'm pretty sure. We didn't find any in your pool, but they live around here. And look at these catfish larvae. They make uh, these little buildings out of sticks. He holds the booklet up so she can see the little clam shells he taped to the sheep. I found these at the pool site, and I figured though these were fairy shrimp too, but I couldn't find any. I know spade, the spadefoots were there earlier this spring, but they're all spread out now. Still, me and my friends did find something interesting. Ben flips to the last page, where he's taped the picture of Ryan and Jenny sitting on the big rock by the dried-up pool. They're both laughing, and Jenny's nose is scrunched up. She's holding the wood frog away from her because she's afraid it's going to poop on her. Ben has barely looked at Mrs. Turner the whole time, but now he sneaks a glance. She's studying the picture of Ryan and Jenny. There is the barest hint of a smile on her face. He wonders if she knows. He's about to find out. He barrels ahead with what he's been planning to say. What could happen here is more important than any grade he's going to get in geography. And I put that picture at the end of the report because of the picture I put at the front of it. Ben flips back to the first page of the report and holds it up for Tabitha Turner to see. The picture is old and crinkled on the edges. It shows two kids sitting on a rock holding toads. The girl is holding the fat toad under her chin and laughing. Tabitha Turner's breath catches. Ben looks up at her and sees her hand go to her mouth, but he's not done. Let me read the first page, he says. Ben reads aloud, over the sound of his heart pounding in his chest. There is a habitat close to me that I just discovered. It's like another planet. Even though it's small, it holds a thousand things. And once there were two kid, there were these two kids who lived near it. They were a brother and sister. They made up a funny story about a giant spirit that looked after the land. They called the creature the Overtoad. This is the story of the land and water that the Overtoad protects. It has protected it for thousands of years, and I hope it protects it for thousands more. My report is about a vernal pool in Edinburgh, Massachusetts. 
Ben watches as Tabitha Turner takes her hand from her mouth and then reaches out for the report. He hands it to her. After staring at the picture for a moment, she looks at the ceiling like she's try trying to see right through it to the sky and then closes the report. She opens it again and leaves through the booklet page by page. When she gets to the picture of Ryan and Jenny, she stares at it and then flips back to the picture of her and her brother. Mrs. Turner, Ben pleads, please don't let them put up the houses where the toads are. I know it's your land, but please don't do it. Mrs. Tibbetts doesn't want you to, to do it either, but she thinks you're mad at her. I know you don't get along. She says you won't listen to her. Tabitha Turner gives him a sad smile. I know what my sister-in-law thinks, she says. She pauses for a moment, then asks, Does she know you're doing this? Ben shakes his head. She thinks it's too late. I was hoping you might sell it to somebody who won't put houses on it, but she says you won't change your mind. He looks at Tabitha Turner. Her face shows nothing. Suddenly, Ben is exhausted. He never should have done this. Mrs. Tibbetts was right. Mrs. Turner stands, the report still in her hands. Um, I'll need that back. Ben says. What will you do with the picture? She asks, handing him the booklet. I'll give it back to Mrs. Tibbetts. If it's all right, I'd like it. Tabitha Turner says. Okay, Ben says. When I get the report back, I'll ask her if I can give it to you. Actually, she adds, I'd like both of them. The other one, too. Sure, Ben says. Okay. Mrs. Turner leads him to the front door and opens it. Thank you for coming by, Ben, she says. Okay, Ben says. If you want... You don't need to say anything more, she says. Thank you for coming by. Ben climbs on his bike for the long ride home. When he looks back, Mrs. Turner is standing behind the storm door watching him. He feels empty. It's all up to the overtoad now. The next day, when Ben sets his terrarium and his report on the, on the big table at the back of the classroom, a bunch of kids gather around. What's in there? Someone asks. Wetland plants, Ben says. Any snakes? Danny Martin asks. Ben shakes his head. Toads? someone else asks frogs there's an american toad in there ben says i can't see it danny says it's camouflaged ben says it doesn't want you to see it let's take it out another kid says i think we should leave it alone ben says it's already freaked out about where it is i'm going to take it back to the woods tomorrow why don't you keep it tommy miller asks i don't feel like it says ben his classmates try to find the toad in the terrarium, but lose interest after a while and drift back to their desks. That's when Ben notices Jenny leafing through his report. Geez, Ben, this is really long, she says. I know, Ben says. I kind of got carried away. Ryan appears at Jenny's side. Let me see, he says and grabs for it. Whoa, it's a million pages. Fifteen, actually, Jenny says. Almost a million, Ryan says, flipping the pages. Don't mess it up, says Ben. Or I'll feed you to the overtoad. As he says that, Mrs. Kutcher comes up beside Ben. Did you bring this in, Ben? She says, looking down at the terrarium. Yeah, he says. It's part of my report. She takes the report out of Ryan's hand and gives it to Mrs. Kutcher. She thumbs through it, and a huge smile spreads across her face. Great work, Ben. Great, great work. Ben grins. It is great work, and he knows it. <laughs>